Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Stratfest Meet the Festival for Freedom, uh, a cabaret exploring the spirit and legacy of Black music. Um, this is a chance for you to get to know a little bit more about this show, uh, about these artists and their careers. Um, and before we dive into conversation, I'd like to begin by recognizing the land uh, where, we, where we make this work. The Stratford Festival is situated on land and waterways originally cared for by the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Neutrals. And um, I'm grateful for this place where we make and share our art, and I'd invite you to learn about the land and communities from which you're participating today, knowing that we're not all together in Stratford. Um, Freedom explores how much of our musical history and the music we enjoy today we owe to Black artists, to Black culture, um, and it provides an opportunity for us to more thoughtfully consider uh, what we think we know about the music we love. Um, uh, Stratford has been a site of storytelling, musical and otherwise, for thousands of years. Um, and today I'm thrilled to be meeting with Camille and Beau, uh, two of its most gifted musical storytellers. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction <clears throat> to today's artists, and I'll remind you that this is an event uh, where we really hope to hear from you. So I have many questions that I could ask them, um, but really, as with all of our Meet the Festival events, we want to hear yours. So let us know where you're tuning in from today, ask your questions in the chat, and we'll answer as many as we can. Okay, uh, so today I'd like to properly welcome Bo Dixon and Camille Ayanga Selenge and thank them for joining us today. Bo is an award-winning actor, music director, and composer who works in musical recording, radio, stage, and screen. He's the curator, director, and music director of Freedom, in which he also sings and plays keyboard and does so many other things. <laughs> uh, this is his second season with the Stratford Festival. Uh, you may have seen him before in Guys and Dolls or HMS Pinafore, and elsewhere, some selected credits include Ghost Quartet with Crow's Theatre, Hamlet and Harlem Duet with Tarragon, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and Secret Chord with Soul Pepper, and As You Like It and Titus Andronicus with Canadian Stage. Both solo albums from Here to East City and Detroit Folk are available on iTunes. Both, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, it's great being here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and Camille uh, is an actor who also works on stage and screen. This season, she's one of the singers in Freedom, and this is her third season with the festival. Uh, so you might have seen her before in Little Shop of Horrors, <coughs> excuse me, and Billy Elliot the Musical. And before March 2020, Camille was slated to perform in Wendy and Peter Pan and Monty Python's Spam a Lot. Elsewhere, some of her selected credits include national tours and Broadway productions of the Book of Mormon. Caroline or Change with the Musical Stage Company and Obsidian Theatre, Ghost the Musical with Drayton, uh, and Queen for a Day the Musical with April 30th Entertainment. Before beginning her career, Camille trained at Sheridan College. Camille, thanks so much for making the time to talk today. Thanks for having me in. I'm happy to be here. So I got to see this cabaret this week, um, and I was just in awe of all that it was. Um, and I could feel that the audience, everyone else in the audience felt that too. Um, I'm wondering just to start, what has it been like to share this work with audiences this summer? Camille. Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really a, a new experience. I think I'm not used to doing, um, we've always talked about how this is like our music that we're sharing with this audience and, um, kind of our experiences and our history and, the coolest thing is having the audiences really like take it in and really listen to the words, listen to the lyrics themselves and um, hear the story and hear what we really want to share. It's really cathartic to have that response from them afterwards and, and have people thank you for doing something that you love and just sharing something that you love. That's really cool. But what yeah. about you? Um, yeah, I echo what Camille has said. You know, um, last night's show, actually, uh, my friends came from London. They brought their kids, seven and nine-year-old. And um, the, the kids were asking so many questions about certain lyrics. Um, and, and uh, you know, the parents, when they went to bed and stuff, and we were 
sitting around chatting. They were so grateful um, and so impressed with the knowledge that their that their kids were inquiring about. So there was we raised. And, and it's just exactly what Camille is saying. We're ra raising awareness. And even my friends who are my peers and contemporaries, they've heard these songs. Uh, it's like they heard the songs for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it is, it is, we are waking the audience. They have been woken up. And, and um, that's what we, well, that's what I set out to do. And uh, with the, the guidance and the help of, fellow singers you know this was a collective job and and so um i think we really accomplished that you know when i set out to curate this you know i want people to walk away going to the cars and the pocket parking lots to talk to talk mm -hmm. about it mm -hmm. and to, to and to ask questions and to be provoked and to start dialogue and that's that's what we, we've accomplished that we're very proud of that yeah oh i mean what you said about hearing things differently or hearing things seemingly for the first time like there were a couple of songs especially that stick out in my mind um redemption song take my hand precious lord songs i've heard a million times that i heard completely differently this time um uh and it it, it made me ask different questions questions i'd never asked before how and and also what you say, Bo, about this being a collective, like that ensemble feel with with all of the artists, the band, the singers is so palpable. How did you approach some of those songs that you know folks have heard before and and make them new, make them yours, share them differently? Well, it's in, it's interesting. Um, it's all in context. So you know, I think because we hear these songs in different environments, different settings, whether it's uh, at a barbecue or whether it's at church or whether it's at a, a disco, you know, a, whatever, dance hall, the, the song before it yeah. can really determine, it can dictate how we psychologically take it in. <laughs> Whereas if we set a framework like this 90 minutes there is going to be a certain rhythm a pace to it and so each song proceeding or whatever is going to assist with that psychological guidance um so uh, i hope i'm trying to answer your question but i i think it's you know we use a bit of narrative text to set you up but we don't use a lot. Uh, I, I think it's important to let the music do the work. But with that narrative text, sort of setting setting the audience up, then launching into a song or songs in a specific order um, really really helps put the, the 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 mindset put you in a proper mindset. Um, yeah, and uh, there's something else I was going to add to it, but I, I hope I answered. Oh, absolutely. You're talking about like the curation of the experience. The curation um, of the experience. It's well said, Louis. No, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and how each bit informs the next. And it's such a, I, I mean, I you feel it at every moment, but then at the end, as you say, you leave with questions that you maybe didn't have at the beginning because of the songs you heard toward the end. and some of the text you chose to include. Mm -hmm. And Bo, you, you curated this piece. What inspired you to first start making it? Yeah, I um, as a person of mixed race, I have always been conflicted with my identity. And, um, you know, I, and I might get emotional. I'm incredibly sensitive when it comes to this topic because you know music has really given me guidance throughout my life it has given me guidance it's given me a sense of security it's given me a sense of ownership it's 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 helped me with my identity my journey with finding out who i am my ancestral lineage 
a lot of the work I do as a playwright is discovering, uh, you know, my African heritage. So this uh, helped in the sense um, uh, that I, I, I wanted to, I've been conflicted as a person of mixed race living in Canada. What is my music? What are, what are my ancestors' music? And uh, this, you know, in doing the research, and me being a music aficionado, like I'm, I am an audiophile, I collect music and all sorts, you know. Um, I wanted to really, uh, I wanted to edutain and sort of use the music as a, as a map to our history, as a journey, and to, um, to kind of make it um, to try to sort of cl clarify it for the audience, but also for myself. It, and, you know, I just learned so much about, you know, it's kind of like this family tree and in, in the song sort of help with, oh well, yeah, you know, my, my great, great, great grandparents, they had to go, they had to endure this to get to here. And then when they came here, this music represents a time when my great grandfather had to get here. And so it's really the, the songs help you travel through history, um, beginning with the Negro spirituals. And then you have the silent voices. And by doing the research and hearing the lyrics and finding out about the songwriters, you find out about our African heritage, our lineage, and really the songs are, are remnants, fabrics of our ancestors, our, our parents are, you know, and so that's what I was wanting to, that's what I was wanting to accomplish. And so I felt it was important and I'm glad, you know, you go into a project where it's like, well, you want to be prepared. Um, so you don't look like a ding dong to, to your other cast me members. But I also really had this instinctive feeling. I don't want to be too prepared. Because I want to, I want to, I want to hear the other actors, the singers. They must contribute, because this is this is more than anything. I mean, the show is called Freedom, so I want them to have freedom to speak their minds, to to be contributing members. I want this to be a collective uh, venture, but also their background, their history is really going to dictate where the journey will take us. Um, yeah, sorry, I blabbed on there for a bit. But... No, not at all. Um, and, and it sounds like music has always been important to you and what has revealed itself to you as you've grown up is the deep connection that that music has to who you are, to your history, to, to Black liberation. Um, Camille, has music always been important in your life? Like. Um, how does that resonate with you? Music is definitely like my number one love. I started, I was doing Afro-Caribbean dance when I was like five years old. Um, my mom is St. Lucian, my dad is Congolese. Um, and so music was like household, Saturday cleaning, music was played for two hours, like all the, all the genres. That's the other thing is that I was listening to reggae, I was listening to dance hall, I was listening to Billy Talent. I was listening to Eminem. Like my mom loves all music. There's no specifics in my house. Um, and what I find is when I'm doing theater, when I'm doing shows, like music really drives me. I really love being a part of shows that have just songs in them and music in them. And Bo actually asked me that because I think in the beginning you had asked us, you know, um, what's your favorite theater experience or what theater do you like doing? And I was just like anything with music. Like I love, I love music. I live for music. Um, so to be a part of something that's just like <laughs> the best of the best one after the other telling such an important story. Um, it just, it's really beautiful. It's really wonderful to, to be able to do exactly what I love with a group of people that um, we collaborate and mix so well. Like it's just been really wonderful, a really wonderful experience, yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat about some of the choices of which versions of songs you you mm -hmm. selected. So 
Uh, Louise is wondering for when the levee breaks, which version did you choose and why, Bo? Um, the McCoy Mini or the Led Zeppelin version, or were you like, no, I'm coming to this actually from a totally different place? So I chose the Memphis Mini because, um, you know, there, there's a, a few reasons. This, this, the concept of the show, you know, I was bouncing around from a few ideas where, um, you know, you ask me, Lois, what inspired me to, to do Freedom? And I should also add, um, I don't think I uh, included this in my rambling, but one of the things was we take for granted the, the, the Black music because a lot of Black artists have been stigmatized. Uh, we can name so many. And we lose over the years, the decades of black music, we have lost either the political message or we have lost the, the, um, the, the intimate message. We, we have lost the message um, because of the image that they portray as a global artist in the pop culture. But along with that, we have you know, the, the, my purpose of the, of the cabaret is to bring to the surface a lot of the black artists that have, that started the blues, that created the blues. And a lot of these artists have been buried or overshadowed by white artists uh, in the 20th century, such as, you know, uh, the late 20th century, such as, you know, like Elvis, he was a big one. You know, uh, I really wanted to touch on uh, these blues songs, like blues artists like Willie Dixon, Lead Belly, uh, Big Mama Thornton, uh, and uh, Memphis Minnie, uh, especially, where they died broke and uh, were somewhat unheard of in the grand scheme of things as far as pop culture, uh, Robert Johnson especially. But they really created rock and roll. But over the, over the decades, they just become forgotten. And so I really wanted to give credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. I grew up listening to Led Zeppelin and a lot of white bands, Cream, and. Um, so many it's unbelievable the Beatles for goodness sake um but as I get older and do the research it's like oh Led Zeppelin didn't write this song oh you know uh Cream didn't write this song uh Creedence Clearwater, Clearwater Revival they didn't write this song um and so then you do the research and again I, you find out about your lineage you find out about these African-American uh, penniless artists that just have a massive catalog. So my original plan was to have the original Memphis Mini When the Levee Breaks, and then we would merge into Zeppelin's When the Levee Breaks, and so the audience could hear that the, the melding and the, 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 the transition. Uh, but, you know, Again, as I as we preface at the top of the show, it's very difficult to encapsulate black music in just 90 minutes. So I had to cut that idea. I knew right away I had to cut it. But I wanted to do the same thing with Hound Dog. Start with Big Mama Thornton's version and then go into uh, Elvis's version. I wanted to do that with Crossroads. So in the end, when I knew I had to do some editing, it was like, you know what? I'm just going to let that sit there, the original give this give the space to the original version and um hopefully let the music again the context of the show uh do the explaining um but i chose memphis mini because she really wasn't recognized she was a female african-american guitarist she was a very good guitarist and um at in at the time of her you know of her success uh, she was uh, a force to reckon with. A lot of other blues guitarists looked up to her and um, were enamored with her, to be honest. But she died penniless. 
and to the point they couldn't she couldn't even they couldn't even afford a gravestone for her bonnie Raitt, um a great blues guitarist uh, uh who is you know austin texas and has a bunch of hits um let's give them something to talk about she financed the gravestone for memphis mini 1986 she uh financed a, a plaque in her commemoration yeah the co-opting of of black artists and black music i think your intention to demonstrate like what we think we know and what we really don't is so clear in the way that you chose like okay i can't I don't have time to do all of this i'll just do this one version and there are folks in the chat saying you know that that hearing hound dog the way that you did it in this show was so full of power um uh and a couple of questions from folks uh, and comments just saying hearing you talk about the fabric of our ancestors really resonates um there is a question folks are wondering if there's a song list anywhere there is in the house program which is online um so yeah you should be able to access that once you click on the house program uh, there's a song list there's a wonderful note from Bo. uh george elliott clark also wrote some excellent program notes um which further elucidate uh some of the work of the show so take a look at that when you have a chance um it's available yeah, there for you it, it's a great program and and um you know, one of the conundrums is we say, please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, but I want to, you know, some people have been like, well, I want to look at the credits and the, the list of songs because the show's going by so quickly. And I, I could see some people sort of conflicted with that. It's like, I, I want to follow along. And, but yes, Lois, you, <clears throat> the program is very helpful because George Elliott Clark is so articulate um with the, the the you know the evolution of black music in in the program he writes a wonderful introduction and i encourage everyone to read it oh yeah it's so helpful um and helpful as you say like people are conflicted you want to read it while you're watching but it's, i also found it really helpful to revisit afterward and sure. to look at the song list afterward and be like oh that's what that was i wasn't sure i didn't know that one um uh, so please yeah use it as a resource as you wish um uh, something you you said, Bo, just made me think of uh, the audience. And with this show, this season, um, you're sharing it with smaller audiences outdoors. Both of you have been at the festival before where you're sharing your work with much larger audiences indoors. And I'm wondering what the the setting of this show and the maybe the the smaller nature of the audience and the configuration gives you uh, as artists that you haven't had before at the festival? I think the intimacy of it is really um, wonderful and lends to our show a lot. Um, just being able, I know sometimes people feel awkward because when you're in a theater, it's, we were talking about this, it's completely dark. No one's looking at you in the eye. You're not supposed to look at the audience in the eyes. So, um, when we're outside, especially for our 11 and three o'clock, I'm just like, hey, buddy over here. And hey, you know, five-year-old sitting in the chair and we start to really connect with everyone. Um, but I think that's what we wanted to do in our show anyway. So it, um, at first people start a little nervous because they're not sure if they want to be seen in that way, but it's hard for me as a performer, but sharing um, not to want to connect to like different people. And it's really nice when you catch someone just like beaming up at you, someone dancing. Um, when we had students here and they were living their complete lives and so excited and you can just feel that energy. Um, it's very different than in the theater you you don't get to feed off of the audience as much. You get to feed off of each other and hope that they're with you. Um, whereas we can really sense um, people coming along the journey with us in our show, yeah. Um, there's a question, just to go back to some of the songs that you've chosen, there's a question from Ruth, just wondering if you can share anything more about Pata Pata or Zimbabwe. Um, anything about those songs, why you chose to include them and, and where you included them in the piece? Camille? I think that's for you. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, um, Pata Pata, I, I love singing that song and um, learning about Miriam and her uh, journey from 
being exiled from South Africa and going to the UK. And, um, but that's something that Bo really taught me. I feel like I'm learning my history through being in this show and especially I'm a girl from Ottawa. I was raised in like suburban Orleans. Um, didn't really know where I fit because my music style was different. My like different from what I was seeing in um, kind of media and how I was supposed to fit into the world. Um, and I thought coming into the show, like I don't have, I'm going to learn a lot. I don't know how much I have to connect and give um, without doing my homework and learning from Bo and learning from Alana and Robert. But um, yeah, the way Bo curated the show and Zimbabwe is my favorite song to do in that show. Like that is, uh, when that starts, I am jamming out on stage. The, but it it really is the um, the message in Zimbabwe and the history behind Pata Pata. And so I think that's Bo that's going to kind of get us there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you know Mikeba, um she, uh, and thank you, Camille, that's, that's great of you to say. Um, Miriam... Um, you know, I actually learned a lot about her <clears throat> in doing the research. I'd always known about her, but I didn't know how her music, she was, because of her beliefs and um, her being such an activist, she was basically in exile from her own country, but leaving um, because of that, her music became popular. And so it actually helped, it, it helped her, her movement, her, her, her battle and her, her resistance movement as far as the apartheid in South Africa. So her, the, the more she was in exile, so it kind of worked in her favor ultimately, um, that the longer she was in exile, the, the more she became popular in Western uh, pop radio. And Pata Pata was a, was a major hit. And it actually brought her back. It allowed her back in to her, um, her, her homeland. And it helped with, uh, with the uh, Pan-Africanism movement. Um, she, you know, that's another, her and Harry Belafonte, you know, Harry Belafonte is another man where it was like, it just, there wasn't enough time to put him in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he was, you know, he was a political activist for most of his career. Um, you know, he's one of my favorite singers. And, and, and Harry and Miriam, they worked together. They did a, a great album, recorded more than one album. Um, and them in partnership, they really brought this, the African sounds to the Western culture. Um, Miriam was re really the first for me to, to be educated with the, the African rhythms and that, that pulse. And it was through her that I sort of ventured with, um, you know, Fili Kuti, uh, Yusuna Dor, um, Ali Farkaturi. Um, and so Miriam McKeever, so I'm, I'm not so well versed with her history, but knowing that she was, um, a, a major influence to the, uh, to, to the African movement, uh, she opened the doors for me for that sound. And that's why I really wanted to have that song, Pata Pata. And it was a huge hit. And she was the first to bring the African sound to uh, Western pop radio. So it was a major breakthrough. Uh, and in so doing that, it brought, uh, it brought awareness to the African liberation, to their, to, their, um, uh, to, the, to their fight for liberation. As far as Bob Marley, Zimbabwe, I could do, um, I could do a whole, I could do a whole show on Bob Marley. Not only, not only just his music, how amazing his music is, but how much his music had a, was a force with the liberation struggle. With not only the libera liberation struggle in, in um, you know, in Africa, but 
around the world, just global awareness, just uh, the, 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 the struggle for humanity, for human awareness. Um, all, so many of his songs, oh my goodness, it's unbelievable. But why I chose Zimbabwe ultimately is Zimbabwe was the last uh, to gain independence um, in Africa. So, you know, the, the Rhodesian, Rhodesia gained its independence from Britain and became Zimbabwe. So uh, Bob Marley, I believe, had a major influence on that independence. And he, uh, he, he performed a concert um, and uh, he basically helped usher in the independence of Zimbabwe and sort of eradicated that British... Uh, you know, the, the British ruling. And so he, he basically, I believe, I believe he, he really single-handedly eradicated colonialism in Zimbabwe. Uh Oh, and uh, I'm just going to shut this here. Don't worry at all. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, so um, I chose Zimbabwe because uh, you know, Yes, because that that song was so direct. It was we're going to fight for our rights, Zimbabwe. And so the um, the soldiers, the, the Rhodesian soldiers, really used that as their national anthem. And um, th there's so many, you know, I could I could talk forever about what Bob Marley did. You know, he in Jamaica, um, you know, he would uh, he would have gather protests meetings in the front of his home and he would basically insisted on the gangs in jamaica in kingston the surrounding area to 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 drop their firearms and to band together and he created these these gatherings these communities of of uh solidarity in and basically these these outlaws to drop arms and to uh to to band together in peace and solidarity with the locals. And so there was all these things that he did that were uh, just politically, uh, just incredibly profound, courageous. Um, he, and he, com he dedicated his life to the Pan-Africanism movement. It's like you could build a show around one song. <laughs> like there's so much history in each song. Yeah. And so much that, you know, you start to pull apart the connections are just endless. Um, I, I encourage people to listen to the album. And again, it's in it's in context. And, you know, I think that's what, you know, when you think of concept albums, um, there's a there's a theme and the whole album sort of centers on that that theme. Survival, Bob Marley's album Survival is a perfect example. That's, you know, there's so the songs like So Much Trouble in the World, Africa Unite, uh, Survival, Zimbabwe, uh, One Drop, and they're all focusing on the Pan-African solidarity, the whole movement of uh, Pan-Africanism. And so you really discover a lot about his, um, ab about his beliefs, his journey, his, uh, his yeah, his, his, his beliefs in music. There's a comment from Mindy suggesting a Freedom 2.0 next season. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Mindy. I'm sure you're not alone in wishing for that. Um, Camille, you said Zimbabwe is your favorite one to perform in yeah. this piece. Do you have a favorite bow? Yeah, I, I would say Zimbabwe. Really? Um, uh, Zimbabwe, because lyrically it is the most direct and poignant. Um, I'm really sorry. This lawnmower is incredibly loud. I, I think so. it's bothering you more than anyone else. So don't yeah, worry. I will not bring it up again. <laughs> so Zimbabwe, um, you know, the simple lines, um, uh, you know, inside every man's chest beats a heart. Um, Zimbabwe, black man, Stevie Wonder's black man. I think because that um, the, the message, but also what it created, the conversations it created in the rehearsal space with us, with the singers, 
Um, and, and so it, it created debate. It created dialogue. And so Black Man is one that is really special to me. Yeah, I'm going to say Black Man in Zimbabwe. Uh, Paula has a question about Black Man and about some of the names that we hear you share uh, as part of that. You know, <clears throat> Sandra O oh stuck out to her, Buffy St. Marie. How did you choose who to include and how to describe them? Is that maybe what you're talking about too, about the conversation generated? Yeah, I, um, we, so when we looked at the lyrics, we, we, he had sent us, Bo had sent us a set list and he assumed that we were all like, yeah, these songs are all great. But of course, us uh, artists, we didn't listen to that one specific song looking at the lyrics. So we sat in the room, um, we had it in front of us and I saw like, okay, yellow man, red man, brown man. And Alana um, was just like, hey, so in 2021, um, what are we going to do about this? Like, what, how, what's our approach to this? Because um, it was either we figure out how we all stand behind this and what it what we're really saying mm -hmm. um, or we don't do the song because if we're not all behind it we're not going to be doing it together and the names in this first section of kind of like the in the song and in the call outs at the end um where we have brown yellow red were part of the original video, I believe, Bo, where um, there's like a classroom setting and a teacher is calling out, you know, who was the first person to do this? And the kids are calling out those names. So we, we um, kept those, but then what we realized is that the song and really um, Stevie Wonder, how he looked at the world and he was saying the world is like a salad, like a mix of salad bowls and there's, or a salad bowl and there's like red peppers and tomatoes. And he just saw it in color. And he also, um, or what we kind of realized is this is how people were looking at us in these color contexts. So this is a yellow man. This is, you know, your red being indigenous or Indian, your um, brown being Hispanic, black, you know, all these colors. And we kind of decided that we wanted to keep that in and I, with that understanding of this is how Stevie saw it. This is how um, we were representing the world at that time, like when this song came out. But also when we switched to African Canadian woman, Korean Canadian woman, um, Inuk woman, Cree women, we're making sure that we're um, we know that that narrative has changed and that we're owning those those names and those um changes because now we know we know better we know uh but it also wasn't really the the colors that he was using weren't to put anyone down or describe anyone in that way it was just how he saw that world and how he was hearing that world described to him from really white people looking at you know this is asian was yellow and whatever so we wanted to make sure that we turn that around in the end and flip that and and um the selection of people, we had so many names, like we, we wrote an entire page of just important people that we wanted to throw out. And we really had to like snip that down. So Sandra O making it in was like, okay, yes, we're going to do this one. And um, Buffy St. Marie and just like picking the names. Buffy St. Marie was a really important one to Alana. She really wanted that name in there. Um, yeah. Bo? Yeah. No, and, and I wanted, yeah, like we were all in agreement um, and I especially wanted Buffy St. Marie because I remember when I was a child seeing her breastfeed on Sesame Street mm -hmm. and that had a massive impact on me and uh, it was like, yes, you know, and I wanted Z Zaila Avant-Garde because she was the first uh, African-American girl to win the Scripps National Spelling Bee and to see the joy on her face. Yeah on the news was just, uh, it was unbelievable. And yeah, like to echo what Camille had said, you know, I, you know, and I should say that that's another example where it's like, I have learned so much by doing this, having this process, by doing this project, because uh, Black Man was a song, uh, like I wanted to, as soon as I knew that I was going to do a show called Freedom, I wanted to do Black Man because for a number of reasons. Over the years, people see Stevie Wonder as a, a great, you know, a funk, he does funk soul, 
and he's music that you dance to. Or he's the guy that everyone remembers. I just called to say I love you. There's one or the other, right? So, but we don't know about his B-sides, the songs that were not, um, that weren't given any accolades because, well, maybe, you know, there's too many or it's just, uh, he, he has been labeled and pigeonholed as a certain artist. And so, but black man, there is so much depth to it, and there is so much uh, political reverence, and and uh, reverence isn't the right word, but you know what I mean. There's it, it's so politically driven that um, I really wanted to do it, and you know, I, I thought of the colors. It was sort of, it always, you know, growing up hearing it, it was like I always thought of it as one thing, where it's like, well, I thought of it as two things: is a black man saying as Camille was saying, is like, well, you call us this, you call us yellow, you call us red. Well, you know, it's through your ignorance, are you not aware that this so-called red man has done this and this and this? And so by calling us just by those simple terms, red, yellow, black, that is, that is, uh, that is being uneducated. Then that is a high major level of ignorance. And mm -hmm. so I always thought of it as a level of irony that not only a black man is calling calling out, but he is blind. So for a blind black man to to use these colors, he's he's saying race is a myth. It's irrelevant what color we are because I don't even see color. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like you can say all of these colors, but it really means nothing. You and so history has proven that we are just it is. It's just this ridiculous cyclical pattern of nonsense. It's what it's the actions that we do that prove our existence, our humanity. Um, and so it is a song of equality. So, you know, I always as a as a kid, I remember I'll never forget reading the lyrics for the first time when I was seven years old and just trying over the years, just trying to figure it out. Where it's like oh, he's a blind black man talking about colors of the either colors of a you know of a stew. I think Alana referred to it as like a stew. These colors in a stew, but also colors of a rainbow. Where it's like, and then also poetically referring to the colors of the flag, the American flag. But yes, Camille, and 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 so when there was, it's not as if that we got into an argument about it. That's not it at all. It was as Camille said exactly. Alana was like, what are we going to do about this song? And I thought, well, no, singing the song is enough for me. And then let's stir the pot just by singing the song. But, you know, Camille and Alana were very, and, you know, Gavin and Robert, they, they, they felt, well, that's not enough. We need to do more. And uh, so I think, you know, us, I think we solved the problem or helped sort of clarify our stance on it by, as Camille said, showing the evolution of, um, you know, what is politically correct, you know, going from red, yellow, black to um, proper reference such as African Canadian, Korean Canadian. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's like a an unsettling of things, a disruption, at least for as an audience member hearing that, like seeing it start to change. Um, it's exactly what you're talking about, Bo, about like disrupting those categorizations and and at the same time providing more imagery of what we're really talking about. And the pace of it seemed maybe this isn't true, but seemed to pick up for me too. So I was like, okay, like there's so much to take in in those moments. And because also, yes, you're so right to be disruptive because the big question, Lois, is, and I, I think Alana was touching on this as well, is would Stevie Wonder perform that song today? But, you know, again, my defense is, well, my response is possibly if it was in the context of the show. Um, and And to me, it's like, let that question sit. I want people to walk away being like, hmm, I'm not sure about that song. I'm going to do research. 
Yeah. And then the research begins. The 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 the, the dialogue begins. Like you said earlier about leaving with questions, like that's yeah. what you hope. Camille, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say you can see the pause, which is actually really um, like good because we start when people start to hear it and they're like, oh, wait, wait. And you're like, OK, you're listening. And you also recognize that this isn't how you identify people anymore. Like you can you can just see the audience start to go, wait a second. And then when we flip it, they're like, I under like they get it. They start to know where we're going. Um which really tells you how like how much they're on the journey with us when they when you just see them take a second they're they're waiting to see where that change is going to come cuz uh, change is going to come yes. uh, <laughs> because they know that this isn't like this isn't what we're doing now and this isn't how we're identifying people and this isn't how we want to hear these um you know cultures represented and then um yeah yeah and it's yeah, it's true. So true, Camille. And you can see it when it's like they're hearing the groove, the song's <laughs> beginning. It's like, yeah, it's got a good beat. And then the more we sing, and it's like, wait a minute, what? Yep. <laughs> you say, what? And then, like, people are leaning in. And, like the clapping stops, but the engage begins. And at the end, though, the, the applause at the end is like, okay, so you didn't, <laughs> they, they, they started like heavy, then they start listening and then it's done. And they're like, thank you. This was awesome. And you're like, okay, good. <laughs> you understood you, you were with us. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. And you know, and, it, and it's like the, another moment like that, Camille, I think is in take my hand, precious Lord, where Alana sings the song. And while she's singing in the middle uh of the verses, Camille and Robert name off um, uh, a lot of the a lot of people of color that were murdered by police, or you know, I, it, it's 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 devastating. It's unbelievable, and and the list, like the ninety minutes, you can't. You, there's no time to go to to give the list mm-hmm. of everyone, uh, and it is a very moving moment. It is very difficult. Uh, and so when it finishes, the audience is in a moment of, uh, well, do we clap? Yeah. What do we do? Mm-hmm. And then that moment, that 10 seconds is just, uh, it, it really defines, it, it encapsulates, I'm going to say that word again, where we are today in 2021. What do we do? Mm-hmm uh are we celebrating or are we mourning and it's it's a very um uh it's a very arresting moment Mm -hmm. and um it's it's very interesting to see how people respond i think ultimately i mean camille you would you know jump in anytime i don't know whether the majority has been people clapping ultimately to say well done thank Mm -hmm. you for acknowledging that or they're clapping respectfully to say, you saying that beautifully and the message is loud and clear. But then there's moments, and I don't know about you, Camille, is when there is silence. Yeah. I think that that is very important. And it is, it is, a, it is a moment of everyone is on the same page. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a very, and there's that, just that moment of, clarity for everyone that is there in the space that they understand that we all understand as a as a group as a community and lately camille i've the last few shows no matter what happens i just like to take a pause Mm -hmm. i've watched you do that yeah and just sit in that silence and i don't know why i started doing it but it was just uh it was like Let's take ownership of this pause. Let's take ownership of this moment because we, we have, as artists, have that privilege. We have the privilege, responsibility, and we have the freedom to take that pause. And uh, yeah, I, I really, um, that's, a, that's a very, you know, Lois, you ask, what is our favorite song, you know, Zimbabwe black man. But for me, what is the favorite moment? moment. Mm-hmm. You know, 
wow, there's so many, there's so many good songs actually. Because I, I think about Redemption song. That's a favorite of mine as well. Oh my god, mm-hmm. your voice, Camille, when you bust into that first verse, I just I get teary eyed. Mm-hmm. You you've both been talking a lot about this kind of communication that's happening between you as artists and the audiences um, that you're meeting with. And Al, who's with us right now, has asked, do the fact that the audiences are wearing masks, like, does that create a barrier for you? Or are you able to feel that engagement? It sounds to me like you're feeling that engagement. Um, But I'm wondering what your experience is. I think initially it was tricky for us. We just, I haven't performed for a mass audience. and I remember we'd come off and be like, they liked it, right? They had a good time. Like you, you, um, mm-hmm. you become less dependent on the faces and more dependent on energy, right. which is like a whole other, um, I guess, like vibe between the audience and uh, what's happening on stage. Um, and then you're just doing it because you love the work and you want to share the work, and you're no longer doing it to see um, the responses. Yeah, that's what I think I'm, I've am i started to morph into is that I'm just up there with this amazing group sharing with another group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so true, Camille. And we trust each other so much. And I have never really wanted to do something. I've never wanted to do something. <laughs> this is sounding incredibly selfish. I've never wanted to do something so much for myself and for the group uh then i you know compared to anything that i've ever done in the past like mm-hmm. yes uh, as far as a, a entertainment gig um i just want to do it i want to do it for us mm-hmm. and that belief that we're doing it for us and that it that they the the people hear that and, it, and we know it, you know, Camille's so right. Like it's, it, at the end of the show, they stand up. You can, you can hear that applause, that power. And, uh, and, it, and it's, it's, it, it just flies by the 90 minutes, but it's that, it's, it's that last moment where it's like, we're done. Thank you. We're leaving. And it's like, just that, that energy. And it's that confirmation. It's that confirmation. And I know the people want us to know that. Mm -hmm. Uh, getting so emotional and as you say Bo there are these moments that punctuate that where you you feel it palpably there are so many moments songs to return to because of what you've created and why um I think that's really felt we have just a couple more minutes um uh something that resonated for me and especially in the second half is this conversation around freedom of the mind Um, uh, and I, I felt like I was hearing that more and more as the cabaret went on. And I'm wondering what, what that means to you. I think one of the things that the, as the show goes by, there's, there's, um, there's three passages, you know, we have, um, the Negro spirituals. So it's freedom you know the, the the desire to survive so we use the negro spirituals are is music you know i think people have always thought that negro spirituals are they were sung and created as a source of happiness but it's a sort of a it's they i think the songs were also created as a mourning and as a as a uh, not a celebration of death but sort of like a, a song of desperation, a song of darkness. And, and um, so the reminder for them that we don't have the freedom, this is our only freedom is our voice. But with that call, that voice, it's like, we're still in search of freedom. And the silent voices, when we go to phase two of the, of the show, the silent voices, such as the blues songs that were never, the, the original voices were never heard because they were overshadowed by the, 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 the big wigs in the, in the money, in the money and the music industry who were just out for money. 
so these lost voices, the silent voices, they never had the freedom to fully express themselves with their large catalog, catalog of music. Then we go into the third phase of the show, which is message lost in the voices, where we have, you know, Miriam Makeba, her journey uh, for liberation of Africa and her, 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 her rights and her, her beliefs were lost because Pata Pata was just considered a great pop song. And so we dance to the music. It's got a great beat, but what is the underlying message? What, who is Miriam Makeba? Did she have the freedom? She couldn't even go back to her, her, her home country. So she didn't have that freedom. She didn't have that uh, not only physical, but mental freedom to speak her mind. Uh, and then Bob Marley, for the reasons that I had said, but Bob Marley, you know, we say, you know, he's been regarded as a mascot for the weed smoking culture, you know, and, you know, Bob Marley, you put on Bob Marley, throwing around the Frisbee when you're in like on vacation, or whatever, and have fun, have a barbecue, put on Marley. But what is the message there? Did Marley really have that, um, that freedom? Did he have the freedom to truly express himself the way that he wanted to express himself? So there is, we're talking about uh, artistic freedom. When then we go into Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, these were people, artists that uh, were successful black artists, but in their lives, they didn't have the social freedom that they really wanted. They were, you know, Sam Cooke was shot by a manager because he was, you know, there was, uh, there was conflict with uh, his lifestyle, you know, like Marvin Gaye was shot by his fa father. So that culturally they didn't have that freedom, you know, they, and, and it's, it's very difficult to be on the outside and you, you see while well, these people are, oh, they're successful and their lives are amazing, but how amazing are their lives, especially as black artists, you know, we, we throw them out there to just do the job, but do, are they mentally stable? Are they mentally free from themselves? And so that's sort of that, what we wanted to sort of tackle is um, the freedom, not only of uh, equality as a race, but freedom of the mind. Um. I feel I could ask you 1000 more questions and talk to you for hours about this piece. Um, I'm, but I'm mindful of our time. I'm mindful of your time. Um, I guess I want to end with a question. This show is obviously so meaningful to the two of you and to the other artists involved. It's meant a lot to audiences. I cannot imagine this season uh, without this experience. Um, and uh, someone is asking, Bo, did you pitch this show to the festival? Did the festival ask you to create this? How did it come to be? Uh, because we are so glad that it did. <laughs> um, Stratford approached me. Um, uh, I think they had Stratford, you know, I when I was here doing Guys and Dolls and HMS Pinafore on my downtime, because I'm a, I'm a musician first and foremost. That's what I did before theater. On my downtime, I would play gigs downtown at the bars and I would invite <laughs> I would invite actors uh, to come and play. So I would rehearse with the actors like, hey, you know, Bonnie, are you going to let's do this song and this song? And then so I'd get a bunch of actors because, you know, it's like I want actors to sort of let loose and I want to see the other side of the actors. And, you know, on the weekends or whatever, when a show's done, it's like, whoo, let's go, you know. And I think Stratford picked up on that. You know, I was creating quite an un, you know underground scene, and uh, I think Stratford caught on, and they said, uh, and I also they had originally wanted me to do, uh, you know, uh, in the before time, we were I was scheduled to do a cabaret. Uh, a speakeasy sort of gig after they do the show, uh, Chicago, is it Chicago? Yes. Yeah. And so I was, we, I was hired to put a show on at like 11 PM after the show's done, the patrons can go to uh, 
go see Bo play in the lobby with the with a band and do like you know Chicago blues and stuff. So I think that they kept that idea in their heads, and they so they approached me. They said, "We want you to do something about black music," and they said, "You have free reign. Just come up with an idea." And so I I came up with this, and uh, you know the concept coming up with the concept. And the, the set list, the curation was really the most difficult part because, again, it is incredibly difficult to encapsulate the, the influence Black music has had on our lives in 90 minutes. It's, it's, a, it's an oxymoron. It's, 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 and so one of your panelists, uh, I'm sorry, one of your uh, viewers saying there should be a Freedom 2.0, it's like, yes. <laughs> very much so there should be and yeah, this be. is <laughs> this yeah. is a starting point absolutely um of of what we hope to see much more of um thank you both so much for sharing all that you have today um i know you're in the midst of doing these shows you close tomorrow september tomorrow. 5th <laughs> um so if folks haven't had a chance to see it yet do your very best to come there will be um a recorded version uh later this fall but try to get out if you can uh before september 5th um uh, for folks who are joining us for meet the festival regularly next saturday september 11th uh we'll be talking about i am william with shakur dixon and landon doke um and before we close today uh for those of you who are with me right now please join me in thanking camille and Bo uh, for all that they've shared today thank you both so much for being here it's been a, a joy thank you bye everyone Hi.